Hello, and welcome back again for another week of Wise Women Wednesdays. I'm Jennifer Regular of Lighting the Path. And Lighting the Path is all about helping those that are at a crossroads move into a new direction in their lives. And I support people and guide people in that through online courses and soul empowerment sessions. I'm also the host of Wise Women Wednesdays. And today my special guest is Denise Boivin. She's joining in from Montreal, Canada. And her topic is going to be about her orphan's journey that's been guided by the angels. You see, she was orphaned at the age of four due to a family tragedy. And four years after that, at the age of eight, she had a near-death experience and then was floating around in institutions until she was 18 years old. Then she became inspired to be a professional helper and did that for about 30 years. Now she's enjoying creating women's workshops, circles of love, and all about harvesting the golden nuggets of wisdom. And I'm so excited to have you here, Denise, and share your golden nuggets of wisdom with us and spread some more love. So welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be with you. And I admire your work. So I'm happy to, um, to share. Thank you. Yes. And I would love for you to share um, if you feel comfortable about your orphan's journey, what that was like for you and the memories that you had between four and eight sound pretty traumatic and pretty lonely, I would imagine. Actually, it was, it was kind of a training. I see it now, years later, and I look back. Uh, it was basically uh, my boot camp for my life. And uh, yes, it was tough because, you know, I came from a very warm family and a very loving family. And then, uh, yeah, tragedy stuck with um, my mother was killed and my sister also. And so then, um, yeah, whole life went apart. Uh, and I find, on, I find myself in um, an orphanage and I had a brother and my brother and I only had a year and a half difference, but we were very close. So it was very traumatic to be separated from him, even at the orphanage, but there was a side for the girls and a side for the boys. Oh. And I remember that was that was even like even harder after to be separated. And then we were always in separate separate orphanages or institutions. But you know, occasionally we would see each other maybe once a year or two. And the weird thing is that you know I I really strongly believe that love is the most powerful uh, energy in the whole world because in spite of the fact that we were separated most of our life, um, there's still a bond that's very deep inside. Um, we have totally different ways of looking at life and so, you know, working through uh, various uh, situations, but there's always something deep that keeps us, you know, in contact. And so, um, yeah, so that kind of like was the beginning. Uh, the institutions were very hard uh, because in those days there were a lot of uh, physical uh, and well, physical, I would say, uh, punishment and, and uh, a lot of shame, you know, when they, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of a free spirit. So I question <laughs> why, why do I have to put my eyes down and not look at somebody because I'm being punished or, or why, you know, should I not contest when something is, is unjust? So I didn't have, uh, it was not a smooth journey because I was kind of too much of a free spirit. But at the same time, I always had this kind of inner strength that you know, um, I, I wanted maybe justice or something that had to make sense. Um, and then, um, so I then I was transferred when I was 12 years old into a, into a, in a state uh, boarding school without knowing that I was going to a totally different environment because I was never informed where I was going. And that was also another experience where I spoke only French and all of a sudden, you know, I'm brought in a day ahead of everybody and I'm dropped there. And it's like, hey, uh, yes, I cannot understand anybody and nobody understands me. What's the deal? And so in a way, again, it was all my preparation for my journey where I needed to learn English and I need to bring whatever my journey uh, that I'm doing right now is in English often during the workshop. So it was all the training that I can see now and as a global picture. But then, of course, you know, when you're in it, it's a little, you know, a little hard. So, uh, yeah, so that's basically, that was the beginning of my life. And, and you mentioned a near-death experience at the age of eight, too. What happened then? 
Well, actually, um, during the summers, I used to go to different places and I had gone to uh, uh, an aunt's place for the summer that summer. And they brought, they brought me to the beach, but there was a lot of people. So I was not really supervised and I had never really gone near the, the, the water. So, you know, I was very curious and uh, I went to explore it. And at one point I got caught in some kind of vortex where I couldn't, I uh, couldn't go up. I kept, you know, trying to go up and it, was, it would just pull me down. And I remember that I only panicked for about, I'd say maybe three or four seconds where, you know, you have no more air. So then you go, and, but it wasn't really that painful. It was just very fast. And then uh, I found myself on the other side, but not really like in a tunnel or whatever. I just found myself in a place where um, nowadays we have screen. At that point, we didn't have screen, but it would be like described uh, as a screen where I could see um, sequences of my life. But, you know, I didn't have much of a life. I was eight years old. And I remember just like, you know, looking it out and not having any feelings about it. And then at one point, I just got this sense of this presence. It's very hard to describe, but it's kind of this presence that enfolded me. And it felt so amazingly good, like so love. And I still remember to this day thinking, wow, this is dying, no problem. Okay. And then I was back on the beach. <laughs> and then I was trying to explain what I had lived. And the people were saying, oh, my goodness, she's crazy. She, she, you know, she lacked oxygen. So I never talked about it uh, after that until um, I had this younger sister who was a baby when all this happened. And she was adopted. And uh, she, uh, yeah, so at 18, I had seen her the summer before. And I loved her dearly. And we had made plans like, okay, we have, you have, well, she was not totally 18. She was 17. So. We thought, okay, 18, you'll be legal. Uh, I'll be finished uh, university. I was working myself to university. And then we can just kind of close the door to all this and we'll create our own life. But that summer she drowned, okay? Oh. And that was like, so that was the hardest thing I ever had to experience. That was my whole, like my whole life was um, in shambles in a way. And from that moment, then I just kind of like uh, started, people gave me books and all this. And I was kind of totally turned off. And then that's when I started my journey into uh, doing um, therapy and psychosynthesis, which I found was very helpful. Um, and someone gave me a book about near-death experiences about from Raymond Moody. And then I started reading this and I figured, well, I wasn't crazy. That's exactly what I, what I experienced. So then I realized, okay, so this was a near-death experience. Um, but the near-death experience was very helpful. Uh, when I look in hindsight, it was... Um, it always kept me going uh, in my own path uh, because I knew that uh, one day I'd be back there and it wouldn't be someone like judging me, you did this wrong, did it right. It would be me in front of me. So I always had this habit of looking at myself in the mirror at night and say, okay, uh, if I was gonna die tonight, uh, would I be proud of me? And if I could say yes, then it didn't matter if people approve or disapprove of me, I knew I was going to be okay, okay? And so that was kind of, it's been my guiding light all along. Um, I do things what I feel is inside my kind of intuition. You can call it different things. Um, what feels right for me. And that's always been how I lived my life. Uh, even in university, I remember that a lot of kids were doing a lot of drugs. And um, at one point they were getting, I was getting a lot of pressure. And so I do have a, kind of strong character too. And I remember one point getting quite upset at them and saying, you know what? I really don't care if you spend your weekends, you know, uh, partying, uh, having alcohol, drugs, whatever, and that belongs to you. But I have to work. I don't have parents to pull me to university and I'm not interested. So just like lay off, okay? And after that, people just kind of back up. Okay, fine, you know? So I've always said like, okay, uh, I'll do it my way. And I really don't, you know, you do it your way. I, I have this philosophy, which is like, live and let live. So I will never force my belief on someone because, you know, it's, they each have their own path. But don't, you know, don't try to push me to something I don't want to do because it's not going to work. So I think that all this uh, kind of journey has been like, uh, like I say, a boot camp to help me do the work that I've been doing for the last, you know, 30, 35 years. 
and um, yeah, so this is where I'm at. <laughs> to live and let live and everyone on their own path and to accept where others are at, but then to honor your own path as well and set that boundary as you do you and I'll do me. I love that. Yeah. And I love that you said, but at the end of the day, if you can look at yourself in the mirror, literally as you do and say whether your day was complete or you're happy with the way that you lived today. Yeah. And, and feel comfortable with that and to know that that's well. And that's kind of what we want to be able to do when our time comes as well. You know, when time's up here on earth and we want to make sure that we have no regrets, that we lived life with passion and purpose and integrity, as I hear you speak of. You have a lot of integrity and wisdom and that free spirit, even as a child, even though people were imposing things on you and covering you in shame, you still spoke out. Why? Yeah. My <laughs> Why? To my dismise. You know? <laughs> yeah. I find yeah. that amazing. I find that really incredible, the strength in that. Well, I think that, um, you know, I certainly believe that we are here for a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and all this is all, you know, we think we control life and we don't, you know, so I, I strongly believe also about what's happening right now in our times that um, people are very much into, into fear. Um, and at the same time, for me, it's like I look at it a different way. Uh, I strongly believe that um, security is from the inside out. And because I had to live, you know, as, an, as a, someone along with no family, uh, I was, you know, in many situations that were pretty dangerous. Like at 18, I, went, I was brought back to Montreal and then I had to, you know, work. And I remember one of the, my first job was working from 4 to 12 uh, down, downtown and finishing my shift at 12. I was doing telephone operator. Um, and then come, you know, taking the bus at 12.30 at night and then, you know, walking to where I live and being followed, you know, many times. And, you know, the situations like this where uh, I had to rely on something, you know, like greater than the outside. And I do remember even one situation where I had gotten a summer job uh, doing telemarketing. And that was just my first time I would do that. And the guys that were hiring all our bus girls doing this were not very nice. And so um, they would call us all kinds of names or whatever. I was the only one that spoke English. So the other girls didn't really understand. But I wanted, you know, I needed the money. So I was going to do whatever I needed because I needed to finish my university. And then they started to put pressure. If you didn't have so many uh, results, then they started calling out the, um, um, you know, time, time out, like 10 minutes in the morning. And then they started cutting out lunch. And then when they started cutting out lunch, I figured, no, I mean, this is not acceptable and there's no way. So I, I got up and I said, you know what? That is not acceptable. And no, uh, you cannot do this to us. You know, we, we work hard and we need to have our lunch time. And, and then they start arguing with me and saying, oh, you, you know, just be quiet and blah, blah, sit down. And I said, no, you know, when there are things that are not non-ethical, I will not, you know, close my mouth or whatever. And then I turned around and I said to the girls, by the way, before I leave, because I'm quitting, uh, this is a translation of what they've been calling us, you know, like all, all the bad names and all this. So, and now they're putting pressure on cutting our lunch time. So, you know, if you want to stay, it's up to you, but I'm, I'm not. And I had about four or five uh, girls that walked behind me and I was very proud, like, okay, I did it. Of course, like four or five blocks later, I'm sitting on the bench and I'm, I'm crying because I think, oh, how heck am I gonna get the money for my university and all this? And then this guy comes and sits next to me well dressed and he said, well, why you, you know, what's happening, what's wrong? And I said, like, never mind, you know what? But then after a while, he was, you know, very, seemed to be very pleasant. He talked to me and all this, he said, they said, let me take you out for uh, for um, lunch, okay? And I'm from the U.S. And I said, oh, yeah, I've been there for quite a few years also. I just came back. And so we had something in common. But he said, well, you know, I just applied for a job at Bell Canada. And, you know, I'm waiting and all this. So he said, uh, I, I just, what I, I'm, my hotel is over there. He said, uh, why don't you come with me? I'll just change my clothes and we'll go out whatever you want. So of course, being very innocent, I said, oh, yeah, of course, you know. Of course, when I got in the hotel in his bedroom, that was a totally different story. And also he pulled a knife from my throat and said, okay, it's like, you know, <laughs> you do what I want or else, okay? 
I was, you know, the guy was about 250 pounds, um, how much I could do. Mm. And I remember just like kind of calling help inside and saying, you know, I, I used to talk to my mother or the angel and I said, well, please help me. I don't know what to do anymore. And I got this voice that said, uh, I remember very clearly, it said, uh, tell him that you are minor. But actually I was, I was actually, you know, 18 years old, which was not really, uh, which was here, I was um, an adult, but in the state it was not. And I, you know, and I remember thinking, well, no, even if I say that, he's still going to do whatever, okay? And then the voice came very loud, tell him you are a minor. So I just kind of said, well, you know, you can do whatever you want, but you know, I'm a minor and you know the, you know the cost for that if you do anything to me. And he goes, no, you're not. And I said, yeah, that's why I just lost my job, okay? And it was just that instant that I just confused them for some reason. And he just grabbed me and threw me out of the, the, of the bedroom. And, but I had so many of these, you know, uh, health protection and intervention that I know that it, it doesn't depend on what's on the outside. It depends really on what's it's our guidance inside and that we are always protected when we take the time or we listen. You know, and so I've had many instances like this of knowing that something uh, much greater than me that's taking care of me, that's protecting me, and is protecting everybody. And we all have this guidance. It's just that we're not trained to listen to it, or we don't, you know, we don't want to listen to it. So you find safety then from the inside in your belief in this higher power, the angelic realm, and you're saying that you're speaking to your mom beyond death so having um that kind of connection beyond death you're able to tap into that it's always been like this uh, mm -hmm. it's always, you know it's, it's always been like in impossible situations and then i get the help yes uh, you know when my sister died i was really really like that was a very hard time for me and then um so i went away and i didn't tell anybody where i was i just didn't want anybody tell me i'm sorry for you whatever just like it didn't reach me okay and so uh i went away and then uh, i told my friend i said well uh one of the friend i had met i said uh you know i need to be back in montreal for september because i have one more university and there's no way i'm gonna miss this and so my friend said okay and i uh you know i was brought back in montreal and i went to the register at um uh mcgill and uh, I had just enough money to register. I didn't even have money for my books. I didn't know where I was going to be living. But I just I had in my mind, I have to finish. So I got there and I was doing my, my paper. And then someone, uh, a, kind of an acquaintance, a girl that I, I had seen the years before, wasn't really a friend. I just knew her like that. And she called, oh, hi, Denise, how are you? And then she came next, next to me. And, you know, I was just being back in Montreal and my, you know, my, all the my sister's memory and all this were here and all that so i said well uh you really want to know the truth my summer was hell my sister died and uh which is like something i i, I that totally is destroying my life right now because i just all my plans are with her i am now registering for for this year but i have no idea where i'm gonna live and i have to find myself a job because i lost my job so she oh i'm really sorry and i said okay fine so she left and I'm finishing my stuff. And then all of a sudden, she, I'm leaving. And she goes, she calls me again. She goes, I need some here. And I thought, OK, what is it? So I went. And she said, you know, um, I talked to my sisters. And we just, we all agreeing that we want uh, you to stay with us. And I said, what are you talking about? I just told you I don't have a job. And I have to look for a job first. I don't have the money. And she says, look, that's not a problem for us. Because um, we came. they came from up north, three sisters. They had saved money. And they were living on a high rise next to McGill. Okay. And um, so they had the money and they said, look, that's not a problem. You just come and then whenever you find a job, we'll kind of deal with the money. And I was like, okay. So all I did is like, I remember going to, in the car and saying to my friend, um, I got a place to live. And, and I know she was saying like, what? And I said, yeah. Uh, she said, well, how did you do that? I said, I don't know. I just, just you know, got this answer. And I just took all my stuff. I did not have many things. I have a couple of bags, just brought them up. And for that year, I was like really literally on campus on a high rise. Okay. And it was like, again, it was like, I, I was always kind of helped in some ways. And it was never, not even planned. I just knew that I had this inspiration. I have to go and do my, my stuff. I did it. And then whatever 
solution I needed were, were there. And so that's why it's kind of like not a belief, it's kind of a knowing from my yeah. life experience that, you know, there is inner guidance, there's inner protection, there's security. And when we kind of like, just kind of listen to what's happening inside that we realize that uh, we need to be, we can be in, in faith and hope because it's all from the inside out independent of what's like you know what we looked on the outside yes and having the courage to take that step not knowing you know necessarily what's coming after that but knowing that someone's going to be there to help you that yeah, there's a knowing there's a, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, a, it's annoying and yet it's not even planned it's just something that comes from the inside out yeah um, and like i say you know my my training was being an orphan was having to to deal in a lot of situations with no protection in the beginning well mm -hmm. for a long time and to just kind of develop my own inner strength where you know it's like do whatever I'm going to still do whatever I feel is right yes. okay and it's always helped me through my life uh, even when I work uh, you know I did the master's in counseling psychology and, uh, and then I work in a mental health unit and I opened an office on the side uh, two three days and I worked two days in the mental health unit and I worked there until um, I felt that, you know, their system was going down and that the clients were not respected any longer, where, you know, we had a waiting list and uh, it was six months and then we had meetings and meetings and then the list became a year and a year and a half. And I thought, this doesn't make any sense at all. People are coming on the emergency because they need the help now. How can we do this? And so uh, after mentioning it a few times, not getting any response, and the administration again had changed and the priorities were statistics and uh, reports. And I thought, no, I, I cannot contribute to this kind of, of system. So then I told them I was leaving and then everybody was saying, are you crazy? Everybody wants a kind of job and we have good pay and you're leaving. And I said, yeah, because I cannot respect myself in being in this environment and, and contributing to something that doesn't make any sense. So it was always like things would come up and I just, my, there's something in me that just, okay, that's enough, no way out, okay? And I never knew what was going to be my next step, but it was just like, okay, no, no, I am not going to kind of, uh, uh, in a way, uh, lower my uh, my life values for, for something that doesn't make any sense. So that's been my path. <laughs> Amazing. I love that. And again, that integrity and impeccability and honoring your path and your internal guidance but you also spoke about the angels can you share a little bit more about that and your connection with the angels well the angels started when i i, I remember years ago that uh, my mother was very was very spiritual and i you know i only knew her for i was turning four when when she died uh, but she always was very uh religious she had angel pictures everywhere and it's something you know, I think that there are things you do with children when they're young that really stays with them all their life. And so when I was, um, I remember in the, uh, uh, well, first the orphanage and I went some in the foster home, they didn't, they didn't, they returned me more or less. And then I went to this um, institution and they were really, really hard on us, very rough. And uh, that's why when I read the newspaper about everything they did to the Indian children, uh, yeah, I know it's true because, the, the, you know, in those days they were really tough and they were tough on, on indigenous children, but they were also tough on orphans because for some reason there was, uh, if, if we didn't have parents, it was like something we had done wrong for some kind of weird situation. So, um, yeah, so in, in this institution, there was a lot of, of physical punishment, which, you know, was hard. Uh, and I remember that I, I was very strong and I, wouldn't, I would try never to cry in front of them. But, you know, you get the strap at one point, it does hurt, okay? Um, and then, uh, but that night when I had the covers on top of my head, then I would cry because I knew I didn't want to give them satisfaction. I was young, but I, started, I was still kind of like tough. <laughs> and I remember that I used to always have uh, a little kind of place in my, in my bed for my angel, okay? And I know that somewhere I picked up from my mother when I was young, okay? And uh, I would talk to my angel, okay, under, under the covers, okay. And uh, whenever in situations in life when I there was really kind of situation of danger, I would say, okay, angels, take over. I don't know what to do, okay. And um, they always did. There was always something happened to help me where I was like, okay, I've tried everything. And you say, help yourself and God will help you. Well, I've done my share. So, like, do yours. 
<laughs> talk to my angels like that, you know, and things don't happen. And then I say, okay, well, thank you very much. Okay. And even to this day, you know, when I'm, uh, I'm home, uh, you know, I lose something and I say, okay, oh, geez, you know, I, I really don't have time to look for this. Like, where is it? You know, especially my phone, you know, because <laughs> <So, Yeah. laughs> I, I cut all my home line and now I only have my cell and I don't know how many times I've, you know, like put somewhere and I go, geez, what did I do with it? And I say, okay, look, angels, I don't have time show me where is it and I find them you know <laughs> well, I have this relationship with my angels okay and it's, uh, it's I know that you know this has been one of the most useful thing in my you know in, in in my journey knowing that I have my you know my friend and they're there to help and I use them because uh that's you know they're there for to work so yes it's true Saint Anthony and Angel Shemuel are great at finding things but like you say you don't even know need to know their names you can just say angels where's my phone where are my keys and yeah. they'll guide you to that <laughs> well see they guide they guide us for small things but also for, for the bigger things yes you know? mm -hmm. and that's why protection is you know when we we feel like right now there's a lot of fear all everywhere throughout the world mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that people realize that there is something so much bigger than we are. Mm -hmm. And there's a power that created us as a, a creator that created, we can make, talk about Bing Bang or whatever, but you know what? Uh, there's something original from there, beyond all that. Yes. And um, and it's, it's so, it is present when you allow it to be. It is, but you know, you're not aware of it. You don't close your mind to it. So I find it so important to feel that even all the, the tensions we're going through now that there's a greater good there's like the human kind of level but there will always be you know a higher level and that higher level is um is definitely a creator we can call it different names it doesn't matter it could be god it could be the source or whatever but it is it is something so much bigger than the human level and that power will always be you know the most the the strongest in everything so when you know that, you just think, okay, I don't necessarily like what's going on around me right now, because now we have lockdowns again since last night. Again, everything is locked down, and you know, all everything is closed. No, no public places open, uh, etc. We don't even know if we can see the families now. They they're saying okay, but you know, they may change their mind tomorrow. Uh, there's a lot of cases, so of course people will be in fear. But then if we remember that, you know, we've been giving so many breaths and when it's our turn, it's our turn. And when it's not, it's not, you know, we can just rest in peace that whatever is happening, virus or what, you know what, uh, if it's not my time, I'm not going to go. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. So uh, if we have that faith, then you just kind of go through it. It's not pleasant, but not the end of the world either. You know, so this that's is how I look at it. Yeah, that's that's really important to know and to keep living today. And do you also harvest the golden nuggets, especially in groups of women of love? Can how do how do you do that? How do you harvest those golden nuggets of wisdom? Well, you know, I um, I started doing some workshops, and I did some during the summer. Um, and I just, you know, they always ask us, well, who do you want your your participant to be? And I thought, well, women from fifty five and up would be really great because uh, we have the life experience. Um, we are also at a stage of our life where you're starting to say, okay, when I look at my timeline, okay, I, I may be like my timeline start there and I, I may be finishing life here. And I'm really like this less time ahead of me than there was behind, there is behind me. Mm -hmm. So it might be a good time to start reflecting on where I come from and where I'm going. And for me, it's more like, okay, uh, I have maybe this left. And it's great for me because I know where I come from and I had you know, that experience. So it was like, no problem. All my life was like, oh, the heck am I doing here? It's like, what, what did I do wrong to be brought back here? Uh, so it was just, it's just like, okay, I have this much left. But what I find is most important is like, what can I do? How can I contribute to the most um, to uh, humanity before I leave? That's the question I ask myself, okay? And every day it's like, okay, what can I do today to kind of help and love and forgive, especially forgive? Okay, <laughs> there's a list, you know? Because <laughs> 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 I also realized that when I was on the other side that um, you can change uh, everything when you're on this side of the veil, 
you get on the other side, that's it, it's over. You just have a review. You, don't, you cannot change any of the script there. Mm-hmm. And I realized how important that forgiveness is and that we came here for, we came here to express unconditional love. You know, and it's very easy to have conditional love because, you know, I love you because you're nice to me and you do things the way I want or whatever. However, when you meet people that are not in the same value system, they're not really nice, okay, and they do things that you don't like, then, uh, yeah, it's kind of a job here. <laughs> you need to forgive. And uh, I had a long list because my life hasn't been, <laughs> hadn't been too easy. Uh, and I have to say that I work you know, every day kind of letting go. And some people you can let go within seconds. And other people, you know, it's like layer by layer. (laughs) Some that really like got you and really were mean to you. Um, So when I I started doing the workshops, it was just to help women to take um, kind of an uh, overlook at their lives and see, okay, so what have I accomplished? Uh, I would say, uh, spiritually, emotionally, and what needs to be let go because again, we have a luggage that we drag. Okay, that's why mm-hmm. as we get older, we kind of go very heavy, mm-hmm. okay, unless you kind of lighten the load. And then, okay, what you know, if I was going to die tomorrow in 10 days or in a year, what would I like uh, for me to look at my overview on the other side? Okay, and would I be kind of sorry that I there? Are, I hadn't given enough love. I was in kind, okay. Uh, I had not forgiven certain people. Um, that's the kind of a, of the time we need to have is to to do that kind of reflection. Mm-hmm. You know? And I always say, well, you know, uh, when I talk to my client, I always said, okay, think of a rectangular, okay. And um, you know, a life that's well balanced is like half of it is like reflection. Mm-hmm. And the other half is action. However, in our lifestyle, it's become like action is like 95, 97% of the time. And then if there's any time left, there's a little bit of reflection. Okay. So, and if there is time for reflection, people sometimes just go to media and do whatever. So what do we live in? We live in a world that's in reaction, constant reaction, like little, you know, little hamster going on, bring them and reacting to stimulus response. So we need to increase our time of reflection and the situation that's happening right now in this world, well, you know what? It's giving us some time to reflect because we don't have much choice to, you know, some of the movements we have. So at least we can use that time to do reflection and say, okay, well, so where am I at? What do I need to let go? And what do I want to put in front of me? So that when I get to the exit, I'll be okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go because I've done my job my mission yeah some time to reflect on what truly matters and how you want to live out the rest of your life it's a great time for reevaluation. yeah and decisions on moving forward wow Denise you shared so many wonderful nuggets of wisdom with us today I'm so grateful that you came here and shared with us in your journey you're an inspiring phenomenal woman a free spirit with so much integrity. And it's been an honor to have you as our guest today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, it was my pleasure. <laughs> and I have to say that I also admire your work. And that I find that, you know, we, we actually do need this, um, we call lost circle uh, between women mm. of a certain age, younger than me, obviously, but for women, the certain, uh, you know, we need to get together and work on love. And it starts with, you know, one step at a time, baby steps. And, you know, what, what, what you're doing is actually these baby steps to get women to kind of like really uh, look inside of themselves and share uh, where we all touch base because we all have common things together. Yes. And so it's nice to be able to uh, have a place to go and, and, you know, share that and um, maybe help other women uh, value their own life journey and story because I believe that you know there's not a b- one boring life uh, everybody should re- write a book because everybody is so interesting everybody has a journey absolutely and, yeah and we should all um, share our story because uh, 
it is by that's where we get our own strength that's where we get also um acknowledge and that's where feeling acknowledged you have the strength to say okay what else can i do and maybe we can do some things together and that would be helpful to everyone Absolutely. so our world our world is kind of like right now into separation okay because of the fear mm. we're being isolated or whatever but what we need to do is actually unite at a very deep level and that's that's the the strength that we can have if we do that so Thank you for your channel. I think it's absolutely amazing. Oh, thank you so very much. Yes, that return to love. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> thank you. All right, everybody, um, let us know in the comments what inspired you today. And we'll have another special guest next week. So make sure you tune in and remember to subscribe. We'll see you again on Wise Women Wednesday. Thanks for being here and thanks for being you.